This webinar is sponsored by the CDC TB Education and Training Network and the TB Regional Training and Medical Consultation Centers. Our agenda today includes innovative, patient-centered latent TB infection education materials presented by Marissa Chang, Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Tuberculin Skin Test Workshop online portal presented by Helen McGurry, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And Mini Infectious Disease Update for Nursing Education presented by Kristen Gall and Jude Dean. Before we get started with the presentations, I have a few housekeeping items to go over. Today's event is scheduled for one hour, including the question and answer period. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Southeastern National Tuberculosis Center's website for future viewing. To verify your participation in this event, please provide your email in the email pod on the screen within Adobe Connect. If you provide us with your email address, we will send you an email with a link to the online evaluation following today's presentation. There are no C CE credits available for this activity, but we do value your feedback. You may submit questions for the speakers at any time during the presentation by typing your question in the Q&A chat. Time permitting, questions for the speakers will be addressed after each presentation. Speaker contact information will also be available at the end of each presentation. And now our first presentation, Innovative, Patient-Centered, Latent TB Infection Education Materials. Marissa? Thank you very much, Kay. Good afternoon and good morning to some of you. Hi, my name is Marissa, again, and I'm with the Division of Global Populations at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to share with you all uh, some of the work um, we've been doing on innovative patient-centered TB infection education materials. Um, and to start off, um, we recognize here at uh, MDPH that uh, targeted testing and treatment for TB infection is an important strategy in the fight against tuberculosis. And when thinking about TB infection, uh, immigrants and refugees certainly come to mind as a priority population. They also face uh, many challenges to completing TB infection treatment. So with our health department's focus on health literacy in health education efforts, um, we saw this as a great opportunity for us to put together new TB educational materials that would actually meet the unique needs of uh, refugees and immigrants, many of who have limited English proficiency and limited uh, health literacy skills. So to start off the assessment process, we reviewed existing TB educational materials. Uh, internally, we found our materials uh, pretty old and outdated, created a very long time ago, and we knew that they really weren't being used. Um, in the larger environmental scan, there were many parts of various materials that we liked and thought could be adapted, but in the end, very few were entirely designed with refugees and immigrants as the primary audience. So with all of that, we decided to move forward. And from the beginning, we knew that we needed outside expertise. So we partnered with Communicate Health, and they brought a new level of communication and health literacy experience. And because of this partnership, uh, the project immediately honed in on um, the value of developing highly motivational and action-oriented messages. Uh, graphics were created that demonstrated actions uh, rather than just communicate information. And in this partnership, what we really saw was that we were moving beyond just translation and into intentional design. Um, in embracing health literacy as a priority to this project, uh, one thing our group had to learn was really to let go of words and content. So many of the early development meetings consisted of hours of back and forth, sort of fighting over words, getting everyone on the same page about what language was important, what wasn't. And one outcome of note um, for the, our materials was the choice to actually use TB infection rather than latent TB infection. Some of the reasons behind this was that latent actually translates very poorly and is often understood as, as sleeping. 
So in translated materials, and we're thinking about refugees and immigrants here, um, latent can convey a level of, of non-urgency. And if you think about it, that can be a little bit self defeating if you're talking with someone about the importance of a six to nine month course of treatment. Another benefit to working with Communicate Health was their experience in conducting an effective and efficient pilot testing process with immigrant and refugee communities. Uh, they knew that well-conducted interviews would be sufficiently informative, even with just an eight-person focus group. Um, their experience running uh, these also meant that they knew how to hear and interpret and implement the feedback to make impactful improvements to the materials. Um, and Communicate Health actually suggested that pilot testing with, with providers uh, was not necessary. Um, their rationale was that health providers were not the primary target audience. And while this is true, um, we at the health department did feel like it was important to have provider input because they would be potential users as well. And so we conducted an interviews with a select group of public health providers. Uh, the assessment looked at participants' ability to identify and retain key messages, as well as whether the graphics were being connected with the intended actions that they were pointing toward. Participants were also asked about their preference for bilingual or, or monolingual languages or materials. So from the pilot testing process, um, we did, a lot of helpful information was gathered, and we did find that some graphics were misunderstood by our refugee and immigrant focused participants, um, and so they were revised. Um, one area where there was overwhelming consensus from both providers and participants was the positive reaction to the bilingual materials, and that was actually a surprise to us, um, as well as to communicate health, so it was a huge learning point for both of us. Um, in terms of the designs of the materials varying away from the more traditional health educational materials, this was particularly noticeable in the provider's feedback. So several of the providers expressed concern about the limited amount of information in the materials, and a couple of them even suggested very specific content that we should add in. Um, and while this may have been or could have been understood as a critique of the materials, um, it actually pointed to us that we were moving in the right direction, um, as our goal from the beginning was to focus on very simple, direct, actionable messages, rather than just delivering a lot of information or a lot of content. So with all this process behind us, the final product resulted in the design of four new materials. These materials were designed as a set, but can also be used as standalones. Uh, it's really about encouraging the provider to think about the patient that they have in front of them and to make a conscious decision of which material in the series best fits with where the patient is at um, in their TB infection testing and treatment process. So here I'm just going to briefly flash the materials at you, and then in a later slide I'll break them down a little bit more. So the first material is called You Can Have TB Infection and Feel Healthy. So you can see um, here the, the, the bilingual uh, component of the materials. Um, this is Chinese and um, underneath it's in English. Um, the second set of materials is um, You Have TB Infection, um, a type of TB. Um, the third here is um, how to take your TB medicine. And the last one is uh, titled keep taking your TB medicine. So you can see that um, they are translated into several languages and they've been translated into um, at least 17 different languages. So in terms of implementation or sort of rollout of the materials, we uh, conducted a webinar introducing the materials, uh, which also included a provider tip sheet. Um, so within our state, um, the invitation was extended to uh, state providers, and we had 53 providers who participated. Many were from our local health departments and some from our TV clinics. Um, we, our team of bicultural and bilingual community health workers um, across the state were also trained in the use of the materials. 
And the materials are available online. And we've seen a pretty consistent and steady online traffic and download, downloading of the materials um, since this rollout. In terms of next steps uh, for the future, we hope to conduct a more thorough evaluation of the materials impact. Um, looking at feedback from our community health workers who use them, as well as other public health providers. And of course, we hope that um, we will have also the opportunity to look at if the materials have a measurable impact on patients' knowledge level and, and health behavior patterns. So while that is something that we hope to do in the near future, in the meantime, um, we do have some very interesting anecdotal feedback from patients, from community health workers, and from uh, healthcare providers who have been using the materials. So I'm going to highlight some of those um, pieces by focusing on a few key specific features of the materials. Um, and the first one here, which is uh, pulled out from you have TB infection, a type of TB. Uh, patients have confirmed and said that indeed the graphics are simple and easy to understand and they appreciate the picture-based nature of them. From the same set of materials, there is a part that highlights the benefit of uh, taking medicine for TB infection. Uh, one of the benefits the material talks about is taking medicine as being good for the entire family. And as community health workers have interacted with patients over this part, they found that this statement really seems to elicit questions. So it seems like patients understand the concept of choosing to take medication as good for me, as a good thing for me to do, but they want to know a little bit more about why is it also good for my family. So it's a slightly different perspective, and it's, it's motivational from a very slightly from a different angle in a very subtle way. And so it's been interesting to see that these materials are starting conversations and they are giving providers the opportunity to engage and walk through these conversations with their parent, uh, with their patients, excuse me. In the third material, um, how to take a tea medication, there's a graphic where providers and patients are encouraged to put together a plan of action for when and how to take medication. So again, we're hearing positive feedback on the interactive elements. And finally, um, we've really seen that the bilingual materials and format are really serving multiple purposes in a positive way. Not only are providers and patients able to look at the materials together um, more smoothly, we've heard from patients that they've started to pick up some key um, health literacy vocabulary from just having these materials in their hands. So in summary, what is really exciting to us is that we now have materials that are patient-centered. Again, we've moved from translation of materials that are to materials that are sort of more intentionally designed and materials that have been tailored to more effectively engage and motivate patients, for which preventive medicine often is not a priority, and we, use, we do that through the actions, the pictures, the interactive graphics. And um, what is really innovative is that these materials anticipate questions that patients might actually ask rather than just pushing information um, at patients. And so in that way, the patient-provider relationship is strengthened and patients hopefully are encouraged to engage with TB infection treatment. Um, and yes, we would love for you to take a look at these materials um, to see if they fit in with what you're doing um, um, in your area. They are online. Here is uh, the link. And um, I invite you to come and, and take a look. Um, with that, I want to thank you very much for your time. I also want to recognize and thank um, the hard work of Colleen Statz, um, Sharon Champapai, Jennifer Cochran, and, and our team of community health workers, as well as the partnership with Communicate Health. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marissa, for such an interesting presentation. We have a few questions for you from participants. The first one is, um, can you list some of the languages that these uh, materials are translated into? I know you said 17 languages. Yeah, 17 languages. I will try to list a few of them. Um, sort of. So we have Spanish, uh, Portuguese, um, French. We have uh, Chinese, um, Mandarin as well as Simplified, and several sort of more of the refugee languages such as Somali, um, uh, 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 Hindi, um, Vietnamese, Khmer, um, Karen, Burmese. Um, there's quite a few of them. I know that's not the extensive list. Um, Amharic 
is one. And if you go to the website, they are listed out all by language. So the first page t gives you a list of the, the materials, and then when you click on the materials, it takes you to a second page that then gives you links to all of the different languages that they're available in. Great. Thank you. Uh, another question. Um, how will your community health workers be trying to use these materials? You had mentioned that in one of the slides, that that's one of your next steps. Sure. Um, in fact, the community health workers have already started to use them. Um, our team here, in the way that our clinics are structured, we do have close partnership with some clinics, and we also have the capacity for um, community health workers to um, conduct home visits to sort of priority patients. And so the materials are being um, used in TB clinics as well as in the homes with patients directly. Um, it, it is. It is. It does require some planning and thinking in terms of setting aside time and space. And we found that the clinics that have been able to really use them are sort of the ones that have some time where there's a sort of nurse interaction, which has a little bit more flexibility in time, and then there's an MD time, which is a little bit less flexible. And so we've. I think that's. Those are the clinics that have really been able to kind of um, um, use the, the materials to the best of. Um, yeah, the best. Great. Thank you so much, Marissa. And uh, there were, are some other questions that came in. We're going to move on to the next presentation. Uh, Marissa's contact information is on the uh, slide there. So you folks who still have questions, you can email her directly. Thank you so much, Marissa. Thank you very much, Perry. Marissa, if you don't, this is Donna. If you don't mind, would you please put your um, contact information in the chat box? People could then copy and paste. I will do. I will do that. Yeah, I noticed they're not in the slides. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presentation: Tuberculin Skin Test Workshop Online Portal. Helen. Hey, Perry. Thank you very much. And um, Marissa, thank you for that interesting talk. That was really cool. Okay. Um, so, as stated, I am Helen McGurk from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services TB Control Unit, and today I'm going to be presenting on our Tuberculin Skin Test Workshop online portal. Uh, the Michigan Tuberculosis Control Unit, we'll be calling it TCU in this presentation, has provided a tuberculin skin test workshop and certification for healthcare professionals for over 10 years. The goals of this workshop have always been to improve TB case detection through TST training and improve the quality and competence of TB skin testing for healthcare professionals. In 2014, the TCU evaluated the workshop system and identified five gaps for improvement. The first being incomplete reporting of workshop records, individuals providing courses who were not certified, and inappropriate curricula used in workshops by instructors. These issues were in part due to burdens in record keeping and logistics for staff, workshop instructors and participants, and a difficulty in conducting an accurate evaluation of the workshop. In response, the TCU collaboration with Michigan Public Health Institute, otherwise known as MPHI, to implement an online management system called the TST Online Portal, which would address these issues. Workshop instructor and participant records were moved online for better accessibility, tracking, and evaluation. On to implementation. On January 9, 2015, the TST Online Portal went live. Each type of user had individualized access designed to meet their needs. Participants could search, register, and access records for TST workshops. Instructors can create workshops, create course material, and upload participant information for certification and continuing education requirements. The TCU can upload new course content and relevant guidelines as they become available, and MPHI manages daily maintenance of the portal, certification, and continuing education applications. In uh, May of 2015, TCU and MPHI started an annual survey of workshop participants and instructors in order to assess three main elements of the portal, usability, capacity to appropriately manage needed components, and the ability to improve reporting completeness. 
our survey information is continuously being updated and used to um, assess the portal workshop. As of September 2015, the portal has assisted in holding 254 workshops, certifying 1,777 participants hosting 149 certified instructors and identifying the 15 instructors with expired credentials. The portal allows us to easily identify these instructors and students with expired credentials for follow-up with recertification without burdensome and time-consuming record keeping. Um, additionally, we have uh, at least one TST workshop was offered in 42 counties, which represents about 83% of the total counties in Michigan. And on the next slide, we're going to see how these numbers compare to the preceding five years. So this graph demonstrates the total number of TSD workshops, students, and instructors from January to September in the years 2010 to 2015. When comparing 2015 post-portal launch to the average of the previous five years, there's a 22% increase in the workshops, as seen in the yellow bars, and a 26.5% increase in the number of certified instructors in the blue bars. The increase in the number of workshops and certified instructors represents the growing demand of institutions and organizations interested in employing certified instructors, holding their own TST workshops, and certifying their staff in a standardized fashion. This graph represents the number and types of issues identified in the spring TST workshop survey. There are three main issues that were identified by the launch of the TST online portal. Um, the first being instructors with expired credentials in the red individuals teaching but never certified as instructors in the yellow, and instructors with current credentials but not registered in the online portal in the blue. Um, when we compare the first five months post-portal launch, January through May 2015, with the following months, which are June through September 2015, we can see a decrease in two of the three main issues, that being from January of 2015 to September 2015, the number of instructors identified with expired credentials has decreased from 12 to 3 people, and in the same time frame, the number of uncertified individuals has decreased from 4 to 0. And this graph demonstrates the average number of days between workshop completion and provision of certification and CEs to participants from January to September 2015. Since implementing the TSD online portal, MPHI has decreased the average number of days between workshop completion and provision of certification and CEs by 58%, or from approximately two months to three weeks. A online portal that has been very helpful in minimizing extra paperwork and efforts and certifying our healthcare professionals in the TSD testing and reading field. Um, I would like to thank Sherry Hines and Linda Holton of MPHI, who worked continuously on this project, and Peter Davidson, our program manager and co-founder of the portal. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Ellen. A couple of questions from our audience. The first one is, who and what entity certifies our instructors, and how often is this done? So through this workshop, we um, the Department of Health and Human um, Services designed content and um, other information um, based on CDC current guidelines. And um, we present it in a, um, a sort of standardized fashion for each workshop. Um, we train our trainers out in the field. Um, we have a main group of about 15 trainers for the state of Michigan, and they go out and teach the instructors how to teach this content. Um, and in that case, we have the same people teaching the same amount of information um, over and over again in order to maintain quality control. Okay, great. And there's another question. Is there a cost for this credentialing? Um, in the state of Michigan, we we don't um, have a fee necessarily. We leave that up to our instructors. We do ask that they provide materials for the um, for the class, such as they have a practicum, so they're doing um, they need the TB skin test syringes and um, they need saline to do the practicum and everything like that. So we ask them to provide that, and if they want to ask. Um, 
for a fee for registration for the class in order to pay for some of those materials, they are welcome to, but um, we leave that up to the instructor. Okay, and another question we have, um, what type of quality control uh, measures are in place? Um, so as I mentioned before, we, we maintain the same information for each class. Um, and we also um, assess our instructors yearly with a survey, um, ensuring that they know the information and they're able to answer the, any questions that come up accurately. Um, and in that way, we are ensuring that um, every workshop in the state of Michigan is, is as similar as it can be. Okay, and do you use CDC, TST, training materials? We do, unfortunately, and the reason why we started doing this workshop is there there aren't many TST training materials from the CDC and, and specifically not as updated as they should be, um, but we use as much as there is out there. Okay, great. Thank you so much. That was very interesting, Helen, and we certainly appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Barry. Our final presentation today is Mini Infectious Disease Update for Nursing Education, Kristen and Jude. Okay, um, can everyone hear me? This is Kristen Gall. Can you speak up just a little bit? Yes, most definitely. Um, so I am here to talk about the 2013 and 2015 Nebraska Infectious Disease Updates. My name is Kristen Gall and I'm presenting with Jude Dean. Uh, with the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services out of Lincoln. And we do have a couple of presenters. We have had a program change here in Nebraska. Our longtime uh, TB uh, program manager, Pat Infield, retired after 40 years of service to the program in August. So I'm serving as the TB nurse consultant, previously serving as a TB education focal point for quite a few years. And our new focal point is Jude Dean, who is uh, the new TB education focal point as of September of this year. And she has previously served as, or she currently does continue to serve as a hepatitis program coordinator, and this fits in very nice with the presentation of hepatitis as part of our uh, mini infectious disease update that we did. So just looking at our needs assessment, uh, we have the creation of the uh, DHHS nurse provider unit, which where we were, had the opportunity to provide free nursing to continuing education through our agency for public health entities, and Jude actually served as a lead nurse planner for that unit while it was running. We, all, we focused our, the need was identified that HIV were identified. We had uh, local providers and health departments needed updated IGRA information. IGRAs were really coming up and about at this time, and a lot of our uh, healthcare providers, especially in rural areas, were lacking this information and unfamiliar, unfamiliar with this topic. We hadn't done a training um, since 2009 and wanted to update all of our providers. And we decided to call it the Traveling Bug Show, um, which was sort of fun on our end, uh, is what we had called it here internally. And we wanted to go to nurses to reach out to them. We have so many updates provided in our larger cities in Nebraska, but it's really hard for some of our rural providers to get to um, the eastern side of the state where the population is in most of Nebraska. And we partnered with our AIDS Education Training Center, or the AETC, and we had uh, the nurse practitioner presented uh, as part of our update in 2013, and she's out of the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha. So when I came up developing our objectives and uh, for, for being a speaker, and Pat and Infield and myself both spoke at these trainings, we wanted to describe the benefits and limitations of interferon gamma release assays, also known as IGRAs with um, different tuberculosis risks. So we wanted to um, talk to folks about the history of IGRAs, updated guidelines using IGRAs uh, uh, via the MMWR. In 2013, we had the shortage of the TB antigen and we're prioritizing for our high-risk populations and sort of that was another big topic that was covered in 2013. Also discussed the limitations of the uh, tuberculin skin test, uh, also some case studies, and also um, discussed the um, 3-HP regimen, which was, you know, fairly newer at the time, um, or the 12-week INH rifapentine regimen, 
And also, too, during the training, we had a lot of questions just about general TB in Nebraska, how to treat, diagnose, um, just a lot of things where people just needed updated information. So our education implementation plan included using the nurse provider unit for the free continuing education unit. And we had four professionals uh, travel to distant training sites. And we wanted to head out west and to the north side of state, which are uh, more rural parts of the state. What we did is we offered a four-hour session doing one hour of STDs, one hour of HIV, one hour of HIV and hepatitis C co-infection, and one hour of TB. And that way we would get a variety of audiences. Maybe someone you know, came for one thing, but then they would get the other topic. So we wanted to target all those areas. And we started in the morning, and we did have to provide food since we were doing four hours, and that was problematic since none of our um, areas have extra funding for food. So we worked with our bioterrorism area who did a short training, and due to that we could provide some uh, food for participants. And this is rather challenging, um, having four practicing professionals to get our schedules organized and to, to get this ongoing and advertised. So it did take a lot of coordination and time planning this effort to get out um, to this community. We, um, of course, we traveled uh, using a van, and that was actually sort of a, a funny story, not so much at the time we had gone out to get in the van and realized the van we had reserved um, didn't have any seats. And so we had to use uh, Jews SUV to head out west. And they were long days. Um, Nebraska is a long state, so it takes a whole day to get out to the west. And uh, we did require overnight stay and meals. And we did do three locations during this effort. In total, we educated 118 nurses and healthcare workers in a couple of months. And while the numbers not may seem great, uh, we are a low incidence state for TB, and we also are a rural state. And this is exactly where we wanted to target our efforts. And so I consider this a very good turnout for people in rural parts. We had folks driving you know, hours away um, just because that is the norm out in some of our rural parts, especially in western Nebraska. So this was a win-win situation for everyone. Uh, we did go to Scotts Bluff, which is right um, pretty close to the Wyoming border, and North Platte, which is more in the west central part of the state. Uh, I also did some of the um, invitation out to Wyoming um, state TB control program um, when we did the advertising to make sure any of those folks who wanted to attend could attend since there's uh, far and few between trainings for providers in, on TB and other infectious diseases in rural localities. And then we hit Norfolk, Nebraska, which is up in the northeast part of the state um, in October. Um, in 2014, you may be asking yourself, why didn't we go and do more in 2014? Well, we had some um, different issues going on at the time in 2014. We had a, a big number of cases in Nebraska. We had a 55% increase from 2013 to 2014. And this was the highest percentage increase in the nation. And I do realize we don't have the number of cases that many other states have, but this kept us very busy with our limited staffing. I had the opportunity to do the National Jewish TV course out in Denver in April, which was a, a wonderful experience. And um, we never had the funds to go, so it took eight years for me to finally get out to this training. And we, our, our cases were focused a lot on our, um, just the intensity of our cases were very complex. Uh, and so a lot of my attention was devoted to providing um, education to our healthcare providers with investigations, case management, and um, also to, you know, we have 1.25 FTEs for managing cases, uh, myself being 0.25, and <clears throat> that was ch challenging to begin with, but then I was also um, pregnant. Um, and had my baby last year on this time, so I, I didn't really want to schedule um, another update at the time pending. Um, I would have any medical problems with um, my pregnancy. Uh, looking at our cases in Nebraska for the last five years, you can see most of our cases are concentrated on the eastern side of the state um, in, in Douglas County, which is Omaha, and then Lincoln Lancaster County Health Department, which is in Lincoln, and we're based out of Lincoln. Um, but as you can see around the state, especially in our rural areas, we do have scattered cases noted. And this is a lot of work and a lot of education that is needed for our rural health departments who are given the task to manage TB cases where they just don't have the numbers to have folks um, updated and you know, used to dealing with this. So just an important note why we wanted to focus on some of our 
uh, rural areas um, initially on this update. Uh, looking at our evaluation plan, um, looking from 2013, the uh, CEU evaluations were completed and multiple requests were done for more TB information. The length of training was challenging. Getting people four hours away out of the clinic was rather a hard feat. Um, also, you combine the time with driving. And we also had requests to focus on the eastern side of the state. We had phone calls coming in wanting to know when we were going to come and do the eastern side of the state as there are, you know, the majority of the population is on the eastern side of our state. And people were hearing about TB, locals needed support to answer their questions, and then also, too, we knew Pat Enfield would be retiring soon. She hadn't announced her plans, but I sort of knew that would be happening sooner than later, and so we wanted to get out and sort of um, give updates before we had the staffing change here at the state. So what we decided to do in 2015 is we decided to offer a two-hour um, mini-update, and at this time we just did TB and hepatitis. And we sort of took away the um, uh, uh, TB antigen shortage information and drug shortages information because that wasn't quite a big, as big of a deal at the time. So we focused more heavily on the IGRA updates and the case studies. And the two-hour sessions we offered multiple times a day. We wanted to target, you know, we had people from all different areas of healthcare professionals, school nurses, clinics, um, college health nurses, health departments. And um, locally, we did it three times in one day in Lincoln and in Omaha. And for the further off locations, we did morning and afternoon sessions. And it was very easier to schedule two professionals um, with our schedules so we could get out and do it fairly easily. And we had fairly good turnouts because of nursing shift work, uh, working with people's schedules. And we did uh, five locations, uh, two in Lincoln um, and Omaha. and. Um, a, sessions in uh, southeastern and central Nebraska, and we totaled 242 nurses and healthcare workers were educated in one month, and so Jude and I were very busy. So you can see that we pretty much targeted the whole state, starting in 2013 in Norfolk, in North Platte, and in Scotts Bluff, and then in 2015 targeting Grand Island, Auburn, Lincoln, and Omaha. And so we really, the, the north central part of the state is a very rural part of the state, um, we did have discussions possibly about going back to this um, location with one of our local health departments, but that's something we are interested in pursuing um, possibly next year. Uh, the evaluation and impact, you know, we discovered IGRAs were not being utilized in the field, and a lot of people just didn't even know IGRAs existed, so this was a big um, learning point success in my opinion. We also had a lot of basic TB education that is needed based on the questions where a lot of our providers uh, needed more TB 101 information. And participants were so grateful for the Traveling Bug Show. As I said, you know, being a rural state, um, a lot of times the rural localities are sometimes forgotten, and so folks were very happy that we could get out and um, reach to our population. Um, as I said, you know, we have TB all across the state, just not so much, and it is harder for folks when they don't see it as much as some of our more populated areas. The limiting the time you require people to attend a training assisted to as we seem to have fairly good turnouts, um, especially um, in 2015 with the two-hour session. We have had some more education requests on TB topics since our training, um, such as infection control, and more IGRA questions. And then we had um, 242 participants rated the two-hour sessions as excellent and meeting all objectives 99.3% um, of the time. And um, just wanted to thank Pat Infield, who really was a strong supporter here in Nebraska for uh, TB efforts. And uh, I have my contact information here, as well as Jude's contact information, since she will sort of be taking over the uh, TB education efforts here in Nebraska. And Jude, did you have anything to add? If I can get off mute here. Um, no, I think you did a good job. Okay, I think we're open up for questions. Okay, thank you so much, Kristen and, and Jude. Um, one question I had for you was when you were planning the actual training, uh, how much of it was didactic and how much was it interactive? Did you have some time built in for folks to ask a lot of questions? We did. We had 10 minutes at the end of each session um, built in just for questions. But we, when we started talking, both Kristen and I are um, a little more um, 
uh, casual when we, when we train. We try to even sit down with them so they feel more comfortable asking questions. And so we always put that disclaimer out there stating, if you have a question, ask it in the middle of, you know, whenever it comes up. I'm sure someone else has that question. So we usually use the entire hour each, if not more, because we answered questions as we went along, and that seemed to make a little bit more sense for everyone involved. We also did the case studies where we, we didn't have the audience response system, which would have been nice since we're a little bit more informal here. But, um, you know, we did get some audience response back about, you know, proceeding with um, cases or suspected TB case, um, interpreting an IGRA. So we did, do, we did do some of that during the presentations. Okay, great. Another question for you. Uh, so as you referred to IGRA, the, the IGRAs have had some changes, updates, and uh, one participant wants to know what these are. I think the big thing we, we face in Nebraska is the turnaround time, especially in rural areas. We have had um, significant problems with getting people to utilize IGRAs with the transport time being out in very rural parts of the state. Um, you know, we have had the change in the, the la our public health labs processing time, but, you know, we had people that would not even do IGRAs because um, there was nowhere to send them. Um, they would, I know of a case where someone had to go up to Rapid City in South Dakota to get an IGRA done because there was no place out in western Nebraska that could process a sample timely. So I think eliminating NACR was one of the big goals I wanted to capture um, with our population. Um, you know, as T-SPOT, I know that's different where you have some different time requirements. The problem with um, T-SPOT is we don't have the um, public health lab using it, um, but it definitely is an option. And, you know, I, we talked about both um, testing options to our, you know, our audience, so they were aware of both options for them to utilize to encourage use. Okay, great. And you also mentioned your traveling bug show might go back on the road in the future. What changes will you make to your uh, trainings based on feedback from your participants? Do you have any things you're going to add or revise? Um, you know, I think we did pretty good. I think I would maybe do some more TB 101, especially, you know, if we go in more rural parts just because we don't have the statistics to support it where we meet, need more of a, like a TB 101, just, you know, differentiating between infection and disease and then moving into IGRAs. Um, our provider unit did expire at the end of September, so we're going to have to provide a new application with new objectives. So I would look at possibly that. And then, of course, since Jude is the new focal point, Education, did you have anything you wanted to focus on, Jude? No, it will probably be more of the TB 101, and then we'll have one that's more specific. What we decided to do for this traveling bug show is open it up to more bugs and even infectious disease. So we're going to have kind of a smorgasbord of about 15 one-hour CEUs of different um, groups across the state, um, across DHHS, including radon education for nurses, um, some influenza education, West Nile virus, and, we're, and people are going to get to pick who they want to come out and when they want them to come out. And so that's how the Traveling Bug Show Part 2 is going to happen. So what we'll do is we'll probably do a real specific provider one for TB, and then we'll do a basic TB 101 also, and that'll be part of what they could choose. So they could do the basic 101 and then do something more specific for providers or testing, um, nurse case management, those kinds of things. But we're in the process of putting that. Let me back up. I'm in the process of putting that application together. Well, it sounds fantastic, and it sounds like just being out in the field and having an opportunity to hear from folks really helped you guys, too. Yes, most definitely. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Kristen and Jude, for your presentation. And it looks like that's all the questions we have. I'd like to thank the speakers for their time and effort putting this webinar together, and to thank all the many participants who joined. We had lots and lots of folks on the line today. I'd also like to acknowledge the Southeastern National Tuberculosis Center, especially Donna Setzer, Karen Simpson, and Emily Iluguardo for their assistance and expertise. Also, thanks to the Curry International TB Center, the Global TB Institute at Rutgers, Heartland National TB Center, and the Mayo Clinic Center for TB for recruiting presenters. Special appreciation to my colleague Sarah Siegerlin for her assistance. 
Please be on the lookout for details on our next webinar, which is scheduled for January 28th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you so much. Goodbye.